all there is. I'm your host, Kelly Bargabas, and in today's episode, I'm going to share with you some excerpts and thoughts from my memoir, Chasing the Merry-Go-Round, Holding On to Hope and Home When the World Moves Too Fast. In our last episode that was titled C, I had mentioned that it was my brother, Bobby, who really inspired me to see the world differently and really taught me um, to challenge Um, my perspective and my views of the world and what a normal life looks like. And so that is why I want to share um, some of the story with you today. I haven't spent much time so far in this podcast talking about me. So for those of you who don't know, I grew up in upstate New York. I graduated from high school in this little town called Camden. It was a one stoplight town at the time. And I'm the middle child in a family of five kids. So I have a brother and sister older than me and a brother and sister younger than me. Um, My older sister is an attorney and she's super smart, graduated top of her class. My younger sister is uh, an RN and she is extremely gifted in that area. I think you really have to have a special gift to do what she does. And um, they're all amazing. My parents are amazing. And they all live in Syracuse, New York. Um, I've got some great nieces and nephews that my sisters and brothers have shared with me over the years. And um, it's awesome. I moved to San Diego, California about four years ago to be with my husband, Craig. And I've had a 25 plus year career in business. I am launching a podcast on leadership as well called Here to Lead. So check that out if you're interested. Um, I obtained my CPA a long time ago and have just moved all around in different roles um, in finance and operations, but I've always had a passion for writing. And so it was about, oh, I don't know, in early 2000s, I started really studying and working on my craft of writing at the Downtown Writer Center in Syracuse, New York. And this memoir that I'm going to share with you today began as a writing assignment in a creative nonfiction class there in the spring of 2011. The assignment was to write a seven to 10 page story about anything or anyone. Bewildered without the usual writing prompt, someone in the class asked our instructor, what should we write about? And our our instructor answered with a question, what story do you want to tell? And after just a moment of thought, I knew. I knew I would write about my brother Bobby. I wanted to tell his story, what life is like for someone like him, someone with intellectual and physical disabilities, someone who wants nothing more than to live a normal life, yet from his very beginning, life has been anything but normal. So I wrote a seven-page essay in that class titled The Way He Is. My classmates seemed to really like it, and I think it was the teacher who said, that's a book. And that was all the confirmation I needed. Uh, I think two episodes ago, I talked about trail markers and confirmation that you're on the right path, and that's what her comment was to me. It was a trail marker. And I set out to write this story. After two years of serious writing in the pro program at the Downtown Writer Center, and then another couple of years of rewriting, editing, more writing, more revisions, doubts, panic, and procrastination, divorce, job change, a couple of moves around the country, the book finally came together and published in early 2018. And just to brag on myself a little bit for a second, it did win a Nautilus Silver Award that year, which I was really excited about. So I'm going to jump right in and um, tell you a little bit about the story. I'm going to read the back cover of the book, which is um, this. Life moves fast, too fast for some people. This is the true story of what it's like to live in a world where you can't keep up. Bobby was 10 months old when my mom and dad rescued him from birth parents who were slowly killing him. He was adopted into our family after a lengthy custody battle. Instead of that settling him, it set off a lifelong struggle to find a place to belong, a place to call home. Like an old-fashioned merry-go-round, the world moved at a speed that was just too fast for Bobby. He couldn't keep up, which prevented him from keeping a job, a roof over his head, and the basics needed to survive. The life he dreamt of was always out of reach. No one knew why. While cultural ideals of what a normal life looks like can distort our perspective, chasing the merry-go-round allows readers to see the world through the eyes of a person with intellectual and physical disabilities, which can often be invisible, especially at first glance. It's a story about struggle and hope, survival and resilience, and most of all, the gift of acceptance and love. And then uh, you're going to hear some pages rattling because I actually have the book in front of me. 
And I just wanted to share a little bit from the author's note um, about how the story is told. I begin our story in 1976 when Bobby first entered my life. I tell a story mostly chronologically, but as you know, life is not always a neat narrative arc that moves in a linear, chronological, and progressive path. Often and almost always, it is a series or set of messy circles that intersect and change and move and sometimes sit still for many years until one day something happens or someone says something at just the right time in just the right way and you suddenly see something clearly for the very first time in your life. You realize that something that happened to the six-year-old version of you is directly connected to your 40-year-old self, completing a circle that was in you all along and you had no idea. And so it was with me. So that just, you know, gives you a little clue that there are a lot of aha moments in my journey with Bobby and so many things that I needed to learn about myself and about him and about the world. And now I'm going to read uh, from the prologue. This is a section of the prologue that really sets up the metaphor for the merry-go-round and, and what it's like... Um, for Bobby to live in this this world that we all live in. The best way to describe what life is like for Bobby is an old-fashioned merry-go-round, like the one I grew up riding at the North Bay Elementary School playground. This merry-go-round was an octagon formed by wooden benches held together by steel bars radiating from the center pole. Metal grates covered the opening in the middle. Two hand-foot pumping stations, usually manned by fourth-grade boys, stood on opposite sides. They would push and pull on the steel bars slowly at first until they found their rhythm. Then they'd pump with as much speed as their feet and hands would allow. The rest of us held onto the wooden benches and ran in a pack. Our hands stung with splinters as we pushed as hard and fast as we could. Our sneakers pounded in unison, forming a deep rut in the hard dirt as we tried to keep up with the kids pushing, pulling, and setting the pace. If you faltered or lagged for even a moment, you lost your footing and risked falling. Kids that fell were stepped on. No one slowed down. There were no adults, no referees to guarantee fairness. It was every man for himself. For Bobby, most of the time the world spins like this merry-go-round, with the rest of us running in a pack at a pace he's not capable of. His brain is on cruise control, set at a speed that can't keep up with those who push and pull, make the rules, set the speed. The recorded voice when he calls social services or the gas and electric company, repeating option five, berates him to make a choice and threatens to hang up on him when he's still trying to figure out option one. The daily newspaper, job applications, forms for government assistance, and cell phone contracts, all geared for those with an 8th grade education, are no match for his 3rd grade reading level. The bank teller who refuses to cash his paycheck because he doesn't have a checking account can't be bothered to take the time to listen to him explain why. The cashier at the grocery store rolls her eyes and sighs loudly when it takes him too long to count out his dollar bills and coins. At the playground, once the merry-go-round reached top speed, we jumped onto the moving bench, clutched the bar in front of us, and leaned back into the wind. Silky white milkweed seeds blew across our faces and got caught in our hair and mouths. Intoxicated with speed, we looked around at all the other kids who made it. We considered ourselves worthy of the ride and breathed a sigh of relief. Once on, you had to focus on your grip. You couldn't relax or look down at the kids who fell. If you did, you might be thrown off by the sheer force of the spinning, toss three feet in the air to land on hard ground, maybe get the wind knocked out of you or a scraped knee or split lip, depending on your landing. Some kids knew they wouldn't be able to run fast enough. They saw the rut and the fate of those who tried and failed and decided to stand on the sidelines instead, watching. The rest of us laughed and screamed as if we were the only kids on earth, as if all that mattered to us was that we had a seat on the moving bench. We'd enjoy the ride as long as we could. Other kids couldn't bear to watch and not ride, so they'd walk to the other side of the playground to ride the swings, the teeter-totter, or the slide. Most of the time, Bobby is one who stands on the sidelines and watches the rest of us go round. I tried for many years to help make him fast enough and strong enough to climb onto the merry-go-round. When that didn't work, I tried running for him. I tried carrying him while I ran. I was sure that if I could just get him up on that bench, he would be okay. Instead, 
He has shown me what it's like to stand on the sidelines. And though I will always try to convince the ones pushing and pulling to slow down every once in a while, let people like him on or off, give someone else a turn, when he is on the sidelines, I will stand with him. When he walks to the other side of the playground, I will walk with him. So like I said, that was a little piece of the prologue. And then the story continues and really tells the story of when my parents rescued him and brought him to live with us. He was 10 months old, and we really thought the rescue effort was complete at that point. He grew up in the same house I grew up in with the same parents. He was well taken care of and loved. And he was um, the sweetest little boy, just had the sweetest spirit. Um, But as he moved towards puberty and being a teenager, things really started to change for him. And he really was struggling. He was struggling in school. He was just struggling to follow the rules, struggling to fit in with our family, I feel like. And at 16, he ran away from home. He had found out uh, where his birth parents were. He went looking for them and he left home and it was heartbreaking. He lived on the streets for five years in Binghamton, which is a city in the southern tier of New York, and uh, those were really, really tough years for our family, and, um, you know, eventually he came home, and, you know, we kind of picked up where we left off. I, at that point, was just convinced if I could get him to get his GED, to get a good job, to get his driver's license, to get an apartment, if I could just get him settled and on his own, you know, he would be good. And it was because that was the idea I had of what life should look like, right? That's a normal life. That's what we all strive for. And you know, it just wasn't going to be that easy. And so there were so many frustrating years for him and me of, you know, just moving from job to job, apartment to apartment, bad situation, bad decisions. And we just could not understand what was happening. And finally, um, we, we were able to get him a diagnosis of fetal alcohol syndrome, um, intellectual disabilities. And then in his 20s, he was diagnosed with narcolepsy, which was going to be physically the biggest challenge of his life. So all those diagnoses didn't change anything for him, but it really gave all of us insight into his world and what had been happening with him. And that is, you know, the meat of the story in Chasing the Merry-Go-Round. So now um, this is later in the book, uh, in the really the third section. There's three sections to the book, saved, lost, and found. And this is in the found section. And this chapter is called Treasure. And I think you'll see in this chapter, is re- this is really the setup for what I talked about last week in that episode that I titled C and developing that sixth sense and really um, taking a moment to see people. So I'm going to read that for you now. I'm in, I yelled. I was standing in my hallway in front of the new picture that hung on the wall. It was a psychedelic random pattern of different shapes and shades of brown and orange. The trick was to stand in the right spot, not too far or too near. You had to be just the right distance from it and then fix your eyes at the center of the pattern and wait. We'd yell, I'm in, when our eyes adjusted and we were able to see the image hidden within the pattern. A shipwreck lay cockeyed at the bottom of the ocean in the midst of a coral reef. Plant life had taken over what remained of the ship, the boards worn and faded by the briny water. A treasure chest had burst open when it slammed into the sandy floor, and gold coins and pearl necklaces were spilling over the top and down the side. A peaceful-looking shark swam in and out of the ship's windows. My husband Kevin could always get in faster than me. I had a hard time. We paraded everyone that visited our home in front of the picture to see if they could get in. The trick was being still long enough to let your eyes see what was there. Bobby had settled into a one-bedroom apartment above a garage with an old bed for my parents, a kitchen table with four chairs donated by my sister, and dishes, pots, and pans left by the previous tenant. With his disability compensation, he was able to buy a new couch. 
He took care of the place like it was his own, swept the driveway, mowed the lawn, made sure the garbage cans were out on Tuesday night and back in the garage Wednesday morning. He asked me to be his representative payee once he began receiving disability. His monthly check would be deposited into my account and I would pay his rent, cable bill, and phone bill. He kept any money he made shoveling snow, mowing lawns, or from the new job Vesid had helped him find. He worked 10 hours a week at a convenience store sweeping the parking lot and cleaning gas pumps and the bays of the car wash. The store manager was good to Bobby. She was patient with his drowsiness and saw his work ethic as an honest character as an asset. Bobby's favorite part of the job was cleaning out the vacuum cleaner outside the car wash bay. He's found winning scratch-off lottery tickets, gift cards with small balances left on them, an iPad Nano, a gold ring, pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters. Treasures. Bobby has a knack for finding treasure in what other people consider garbage or junk. He's found these treasures in pawn shops and by the side of the road. He loves to go curbing, searching through the random things that people leave in front of their house with a free sign. Over time, he put up shelves on his new walls and filled them with collectible glasses. Ronald McDonald, Grimace, Fred Flintstone, Shrek, ceramic bears and dogs, pictures of his daughter and his brother and sisters and their families, Hess trucks and matchbox cars. He found a shelf with a clock in the middle that didn't work and positioned the hands at two o'clock to make it look like it worked and hung it up on his wall. He found end tables and other furniture that he stripped, sanded, and stained. His favorite finds were electronics, CD players, televisions, vacuum cleaners, which he could usually get working, and then he'd sell them. He used the workbench in the garage to tinker with the things he found. His curbing used to embarrass me, and his spending money on junk frustrated me. A few years before, I was on the couch watching television, half listening to Bobby on the phone, when he started to tell me about the great deal he got on a used stereo and speakers for $25 at the thrift store. Bob, why? Why would you spend your money on a stereo? You already have two. I rolled my eyes and threw my head back in frustration. Yeah, but this one was nicer. Once I get it working, I'll sell the other two. Don't you think you should save your money for groceries or rent? You know, with the small life I have, things like this make me happy. Moments like these began to stop me in my tracks. I called them playground moments. Moments when I realized, usually after I'd messed up, that I was behaving like those kids on the merry-go-round, trying to get someone, usually Bobby, to behave like me, to run like me, spend like me, live like me, to live a normal life. To do what's expected, I began to catch myself in the middle of those moments, like when I skidded into the express lane at the grocery store, frustrated to find someone ahead of me who I could see would slow me down, someone older, someone who had to set a cane down to count his money, or just some lonely person whose only conversation that day would be with the cashier, and so they took their time. Bobby taught me that I shouldn't judge different sized lives than mine. I asked Bobby to help me write this story. His price? dinner. I asked him questions and read him pages, and he answered between bites, helping me with the details. One night, between swigs of my chocolate milkshake and bites of french fries, I asked my brother, Bob, what do you want people to know about you? What do you want people to know? I waited for him to answer while he finished chewing his barbecue chicken sandwich. He was a notoriously slow eater. He savored every single bite. I was done at least 15 minutes before him. That's how it always was with him. He was the last one eating, the last one to put his fork down, the last one at the table at every single meal. He took his time when it came to food. I waited as he took a sip of his orange creamsicle shake. When he was done, he looked up at me and told me as sure as anything that I'm not a disease. I'm in. So as you can see, Bobby just has this way of dropping profound truth in these one-line sentences that you are completely not expecting and he does it all the time he still does it and um it's just amazing he's amazing one of his other lifelong dreams of course is to have his own home you know i think that's pretty common i believe home is a place all of us want to be we all want to have our corner of the world where people know us love us accept us where we have enough where we are enough and bobby's no different he's always wanted that and that dream has always been elusive to him, especially at this time in his life, you know, that what I'm reading about, there was so much struggle and, you know, so many days where it just didn't look like it would ever happen for him. Um, what's really 
amazing now is in 2020, uh, a few months ago, I think it was April, my sister Shelly and her husband Don bought a house for Bobby to live in, in this uh, suburb of Syracuse called Maddie Dale. And so Bobby has a little two bedroom house with a small yard. And he moved in and has been taking care of it. And it needed some TLC when he moved in. And he has just been so excited to get into that place and make it his own. And I don't know if I've ever seen him so happy. It's really been a, an amazing experience for him. But this last section I'm going to read is called Group Home. And again, at this point in our story, um, Bobby even living on his own was a struggle, as you'll see. So... I'm just going to read it. This is the last section that I'm going to read. It's called Group Home. I pulled into Bobby's driveway, stopping just a few feet from his overhead garage door. I was there to take him to a doctor's appointment. I could see him, his big round head in the window looking right at me. I waited for him to come out, but he didn't move. I was already running a little late and wondered if we would make it in time for his appointment with the neurologist. Still, he didn't move. Rather than beep the horn, I got out to see why he wasn't coming. When my car door slammed shut, his body suddenly bounced to life and he jerked his head. I realized he had fallen asleep standing up, waiting for me. I still took him to most of his doctor's appointments, but once things were a little more settled with doctors that took his government insurance, actually asked him questions, listened to his answers, and really examined him, sometimes my parents took him. But only to the easy ones, podiatrist, general practitioner, eye doctor, I wouldn't give up the neurologist. Not long after that day, I was out of town when my mother took him to his appointment with a nutritionist, an expert in diabetic nutrition, to talk about his rising blood sugar. I had coached her on the phone before the appointment. I told her to make sure the nutritionist didn't yell at him for not losing weight and to explain to her that obesity is a side effect of both narcolepsy and fetal alcohol syndrome, that some of his nine medicines could elevate his blood glucose, that he didn't understand how to read nutrition labels and struggled with recipes. I reminded her that he gets nervous with doctors and anyone he perceives in a position of authority. I told her not to let them put him on insulin until we understood how it would affect his narcolepsy, until they talked to his neurologist. I reminded her of the baby she rescued all those years ago and that she wasn't done. She still needed to fight for him. My mother listened to me go on and on and on and promised to call me after the appointment. It didn't go well were her first words when I answered the phone. Shit, I knew I should have taken him to the appointment. Bobby's fasting blood sugar was 544, my mother continued. Diabetes would be the latest in a long line of self-destructive attacks his body would wage against itself. He's at risk of diabetic coma, aneurysm, stroke, heart attack. Could happen any time. He has to get his sugar down. He could die at any time, Kelly. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Keep going. I was taking notes as she was talking. I always took notes. I knew I would need them at some point. As I tried to keep up with her and write down the key words, my brain kept getting stuck on, he could die at any time. The doctor wants to prescribe insulin, one shot per day. I had been against putting him on insulin. He was already taking so many medications. Pills strong enough to keep him awake during the day, pills that control his cataplexy and electrical shocks that run through his body, the pill that is supposed to keep the hallucinations at bay, the pill he has to take to counteract the one that keeps him awake all day so he can sleep through the night, pills for his high cholesterol, triglycerides, and heartburn. How could one more drug be good for him? The doctor really thinks it will be okay. Our bodies make insulin already. It should make him feel better, my mom said. I made a note to call his neurologist later to verify that insulin wouldn't make his narcolepsy worse. She is concerned that Bobby won't be able to manage this himself. He doesn't remember to take his medicine now. He can't forget his insulin. He also needs to change his diet and lose weight, which he doesn't seem able to do on his own, my mom said. I don't argue with her. He doesn't always remember. He needed to be reminded to take his medicines, to eat the right things, and he didn't always make the right decision. The diagnosis of his developmental disabilities as a result of fetal alcohol syndrome a few years ago helped us understand and accept why. Still, I was defensive when other people accused him of it. Kelly, she also mentioned a group home. Bobby broke down in the doctor's office as soon as she said it. This is also when I broke down. Group home. I had trouble focusing on anything else my mother said after that. My throat closed off my words. I tried holding back my tears so I could finish the phone call, but I couldn't stop them. My tears fell, spotting my notepad. Mom, we're not putting him in a group home. He's 37 years old. Kelly, it may be the only option. 
Well, it's going to be the last option. Before we hung up, we talked for a few more minutes about the details of when his prescription would be ready and and whether or not my sister Patty and RN could set him help, help set up home care. I stopped trying to hold back my tears and I cried. My chest heaved with sobs. I could no longer contain. Strange noises came from my throat. I was alone and I didn't care what I looked like or sounded like. I let the cries come. I let the tears fall and my nose run. My mind drifted to Bobby. How upset he must have been. I wish I had been there at the doctor's office with him. I called Bobby and we talked about what the doctor said. I told him we would do whatever we could. I told him he had to try harder to do better. He had to help me fight this. We'll figure it out, Bob. We always do. After we hung up, I lay down on the couch and closed my eyes. I tried to come up with a plan for this latest challenge, tried to think of the next thing I could do, the phone calls I needed to make. Since Bobby came into my life 36 years ago, I had been trying to keep him alive and to help him find a place he can call home. I had chased him all over Binghamton when he ran away at 16. When he came back, I still followed him to East Canal Street, West Canal Street, our parents' home, Five Corners, William Street, Madison Street, Lenox Avenue, behind some bar on some street neither of us can remember, Canal Street again, Walnut Street, Florida Road, North Main Street, a friend's extra bedroom in Central Square, a friend's couch in North Syracuse, the John Milton Inn, starting over again after the fire, searching and finding him over and over again, the jobs he had and lost, the testings, the forms, all with one goal, to give him the life he deserves, the life he dreams of, his own corner of the world, with a family and a home of his own. So that's the end of that section, and that's the end of what I'm going to read out of this book. And the thing is, there are many people like my brother in this world, people who need a little extra help to keep up with this fast-paced system we've created. How we care for those who need help has an everlasting impact. If the basic needs of a person's spirit, soul, and body are met, it allows them the ability to keep their own corner of the world, their home, safe and prosperous for them and their family. And in writing this story, you know, my greatest hope was that readers and listeners uh, would be challenged with what their expectation was of what a normal life is. I wanted readers and listeners to see that there is treasure in everyone if we take the time to see it, and that even though we may not always get the life we dream of, it is still a life, and happiness can be found in simple pleasures. Those are some of the things that, that Bobby taught me, and, um, and I needed to share that with the world. So uh, thank you for hanging in there. I know this episode was a little longer than the others. Thank you so much for listening. I want to let you know that my next episode is going to be an interview with Bobby. So you'll be able to hear from him, hear his voice. He is a really special person and I think you'll fall in love with him. So you don't want to miss it. If you want the whole story, of course, the book is available on Amazon in audio, Kindle, and print versions. And as always, you can find more information and contact me by going to my website, kellybargabus.com slash podcasts. And if you got something useful by listening today, please subscribe, share, or review all there is. I'd appreciate it. Take care. <laughs>